Hello and welcome back to DWeb Decoded. I'm Danny O'Brien. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. And uh, this is a show devoted to talking to the movers and shakers, do people still say that, um, in the decentralized web world. People trying to return the internet back to its original goal and dream, which is uh, access, equity, and autonomy for everyone. Equally, a lot of ease. I'm joined today um, by uh, yet another one of my heroes, um, Marnie Webb. Marnie Webb is Chief Community Impact Officer for the uh, the nonprofits, nonprofit I would call them, TechSoup, and also leads Caravan Studios there, a division of TechSoup. In a role, she works with communities around the world uh, to describe desired impact and to develop technology solutions with them that help them move them towards that impact. Um, I, I, we should, before we delve into to, to what you do in at Caravan Studios, which is the meat of what we're going to talk about, um, I just called TechSoup the nonprofit's nonprofit, and then I suddenly thought, I know, I come from the nonprofit environment, so like I've known TechSoup, you know, for 20 years, but I'm sure there are people out there um, that don't know what you do. And were you, how long have you been at TechSoup? I've been at TechSoup for 23 years. So what is TechSoup? You should know by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got this down. I've said it once or twice at this point in time. So um, for over over 30 years, actually, TechSoup has been helping nonprofits around the world be able to acquire and use technology and manage their digital stack in ways that help them achieve their goals in practice. Right. That means that we're working with large corporations to help manage donations and discounts to over 300,000 nonprofit organizations a year. And then we help them figure out how to use those in ways that are meaningful to them. Increasingly, we are working on helping them develop technology that fits their need anywhere on the, the no code to full code spectrum. Right, right. So it's, it's interesting because I think nonprofits aren't necessarily a place where people, a, a, a domain where people think about making products for them, mm -hmm. except when they're imagining the possibilities of technology, right? Mm -hmm. There's always this sort of interesting tension where they, people go, you know, we could use tech to connect people together to do good. But what we mainly do is word processors um, for, for the enterprise stack. And I came into, my experience with TechSoup, as you said, is sort of in the world where nonprofits had to wrap themselves around existing products by Microsoft or IBM even, like kind of tools that were built for profit-making organizations. And then nonprofits had to like kind of come along for the ride. Um, and that included licenses, right? So um, maybe you can uh, just sort of like, what does that mean for TechSoup to manage the, those licenses? Yeah, well, we don't manage the licenses. We, we help support um, getting the licenses into the hands of organizations. And, and for a long time, it was saying, how do you, you know, round nonprofit, fit yourself into the square corporate hole that this technology has, has made for you, but increasingly with software as a service, you're able to configure these technologies in more and more interesting ways. And there are more no code and low code options that allow organizations to build workflows that actually suit them, rather than them trying to sort of twist themselves and fit into a designed workflow that was made for a corporation. Yeah, I guess this is ancient history now, but um... Uh, I, uh, one of the, I, I'm trying to sort of tie together like TechSoup yeah. also has kind of like a, 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 a bigger, more aspirational sort of aim. Uh, one of the things that, that TechSoup would do would get or sort out licenses for office software. Um, there was this time, this was when I was at the Committee to Protect Journalists, when we realized that the Russian government was using the fact that many nonprofits mm -hmm. in uh, Russia and, and also the mm -hmm. former Soviet states, um, like they couldn't get, or they didn't think that they could get licenses, so they would use um, <clears throat> pirated copies of Windows. So did everyone else, right? Like, you know, it was not un uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then 
the the Russian government would come, or the Stan government, authoritarian governments would come and basically seize mm -hmm. and shut down like independent media and stuff like that, claiming to be mm -hmm. enforcing Microsoft's IP rights. Mm -hmm. um, and TechSoup did this amazing thing, which is like kind of negotiate with Microsoft and go, this is happening not because they don't want your software, but because they don't know how to do it. And Microsoft did this, and a few web companies did this amazing deal where they basically just said, if you are independent media in these countries, just fill out this form and you will you will get a license. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Microsoft did some amazing work actually, and they, they deserve like a huge amount of credit for the work that they did in several countries. It, it wasn't just because people were using pirated software. Actually, there were governments um, confiscating computers from organizations, legitimate civil society organizations, maybe working against the express interest of the government. They would confiscate the computers to verify. Oh, wow. Really licensed. And then they would return the computers, you know, saying, oh, you, you are properly licensed. Um, and, uh, but your computer had to get completely cleaned in the process of us checking to see if it was properly licensed. It's right. A few years ago, probably close to 18 years ago now, um, there was a big New York Times story about this uh, focused on an environmental organization and what had happened to an environmental organization. And Microsoft went in and they worked to develop some licensing that was particular to these instances. They had a list of, I think, about nine countries in which they said, actually, if you're a civil society organization and you have our product, that constitutes a legal license, whether you can prove it in any other way or not. So it didn't matter whether you had got it from TechSoup, whether you you know bought it at whatever store was available to you or got it as OEM, or you were using a pirated copy of the software. They were using the combination of your legal status and the fact that you had their product as evidence of license to help combat this particular issue. That program, you know, ended a, a few years ago as on-premise software started to change. You know, right. our role in those kinds of things is to help make sure nonprofit organizations know what's available to them. Mm -hmm. You know, increasingly, we're facing the same kind of problem you were just talking about, but it's pointed at data storage. Right. And how organizations' data is and isn't being used. Who owns data whenever it's in a software as a service system, whenever it's sitting on Amazon's cloud, whenever Facebook has the keys to it, you know? And, and how do organizations think about protecting their data so that they can deliver their services? And in a world in which an increasing number of countries are, are closing down the space in which civil society operates, how are you helping groups of people that may not be able to formally organize as nonprofits access and use resources. I think there's always this, and I, I mean, people in information security always talk about threat model. And I know when I'm, I'm working in this space, people are always like, God, that sounds a little militaristic. I'm a nonprofit. Um, but there is this model where you have a set of goals. You also have a set of risks attached to you. And yeah. they don't have to be as extreme as that. They can just be, you know, if we lose this data, we're, we're, we're screwed, right? Um, and then you have the goals and the intents of the third party you're using, whether mm -hmm. it's like, the, you know, the way the software is built or, you know, the Google has to make money somehow, so it has to collect data or put ads somewhere. Um, and I, I, I've always felt like, you know, th there are some people who have better access to those companies to at least convey what they need. Um, but it's more of a struggle for nonprofits because they're not a huge you know, they're not going to be multi-million dollar winners. But also, they're just in different worlds, right? Like, they're trying to just just keep their little mini library working or um, uh, keep people fed in, in, in the soup kitchen. So how do you... Do you kind of, like, collect what people are thinking and then go to, you know, either, you know, the companies and say... Hey, could you have this feature? Do you try and adapt what they're producing for the nonprofit world? Yeah, so, y yes. Um, <laughs> so we, um, 
you, you know, for some companies, we have an opportunity to influence, including some very large companies, we have the opportunity to influence the feature set typically of new products that they're working on that may have a clear connection to some of the aims of civil society. Um, and those can be products that allow you to manipulate or use data. They can be, they're, they're, they're often building block style products, like in the Microsoft world, it might be Dynamics. For example, um, but most end users aren't going to use without somebody having put it together for them because that gives an opportunity to develop customizations that, that work for the nonprofit sector. In other instances, it may be helping localize a product, so which may be a lot about language, like literal language, like, like Korean, you know, um, so that organizations actually have access to the training materials that make those products meaningful to them. And um, I mean, we, we saw this with, with one of our partners whenever they translated a bunch of training into Arabic. There just is not that much training available for nonprofit organizations in that language. So being able right. to train from the, pers teach somebody to use a pro product from the perspective that they have when they're coming to that product is a tremendous benefit, you know, in, in their local language. And so, so we do do a lot of that kind of work. We also, and again, I, I think this is a big, a, a big opportunity for the sector, with so, both with software as a service, but also with decentralized tools of all sorts, which is to aggregate needs of specific communities within nonprofit, within civil society as a whole, and then help develop the tooling, whatever exactly that means that meets those needs. So I'm going to give a really specific and and relatively small example of this, we have a team of cultural anthropologists that interviews organizations, and that's one of the ways we aggregate their needs is a really typical sort of social science style interview and coding and analysis. And in doing that, we discovered that organizations that ran food pantries in the United States really liked and wanted to keep some of the changes they made to address the issue, issues that came up with serving their clients during the COVID pandemic, during the lockdown phase. Specifically, they wanted people to be able to make appointments to come pick up food. Right. And not right. have to stand in line at a public place, at a food pantry for some X amount of time to get the food. That appointment setting was, was good. And so they started looking for tools to do that. And in many cases, they would pay with, for a tool or they would wrestle a tool. What many of them did not know is that they had those tools nested inside things they already had. They had it as bookings inside of their Microsoft suite. They right. had it inside of their Google suite. They could even use a tool like Asana to schedule and set up bookings. So we went through and said, okay, if, if you wanna let your clients be able to set an appointment and you have this tool, here's how to set it up to meet your specific needs. If you have this tool, here's how to set it up. And it's sort of non-standard because when you look at those tools, Microsoft Bookings is a good example. It's set up with the idea that you're setting, you're a professional setting up a consulting appointment with somebody, right. not a food pantry setting up a time for to pick up food, right? So right. providing that translation layer, we found is important, especially for nonprofits, because they aren't doing what I do, which is like on Saturday, pour a cup of coffee and open these tools and just sit there and click all the buttons for five hours. Right, right, right. 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 That's both my job and I think it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> and and that's not what they're doing, you, you know? And so that that's the kind of stuff that we can do for them and provide those translations for them. Sometimes it's as simple as, or as straightforward as what I just said. And other times it's more sophisticated where, where we are or we're organizing information that ends up going into the hands of developers. Right. Build out code to meet the needs. Right. The, um, it's interesting because I think that that feels and God knows, like when you go into a new ecosystem, like I went away from I think I had some stuff set up on Amazon in the early days of, um, of AWS and I sort of went back actually to be honest, viewers, I had to. I found that like I'm being billed thirty dollars a month, um, and I knew this because I just got a message today saying your credit card is expired and we're going to cut <laughs> off everything. And and I sort of went, oh God, what do I still have on Amazon? And then I was like, okay, let me look. And it's a whole world, right? It's like you're looking at this, and they're called things like you know Amazon Teardrop or like Amazon like cheese sandwich 
And I'm going, I have no idea what's going on. And you need a navigator in those, in those environments to go, oh yeah, what you want is, is, is this. Um, which brings us nicely, right? Because we, we at FFTW, we, we, we recognize what role you play in, the, in, in uh, other ecosystems. So we were like, okay, now there's a decentralized set of tools, right? By a million people. And like, they all are like geek oriented. And the, some of them are documented well, some of them are less well. And all of them um, are different. To, from what you would have before. And how do you, I mean, this was the question we kind of brought to you, which was like, how do you, how do you connect this interesting technology, which in many ways is free of some of those like directional differences that the enterprise software have, but how does a, how does a, a, a nonprofit around the world even know whether this is going to be useful for them? Um, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm going, and what, what, what's the answer, Marnie? Like you've, yeah. you've, you've had like, you know, a few months already. So, yeah. but like, what, how do you even begin to like solve that problem? Yeah, it, it's a hard and interesting problem to g dig into. And we're learning things. I, I don't, I don't know that. And I, I, I mean, you know, this as well, I, I, but I don't know that there is a solution as much as there are a bunch of different pathways to get to the answers some of which may be more straightforward and easier traveled than others. Right. Um, and so the, the thing that we know from surveys and experience is that nonprofit organizations adopt technology because they, their old way of doing something became obsolete. Interesting. And they get recommendations from their peers. The interesting thing about new technologies, particularly new technologies that are, that are conceptually tough, like, like D-Web technologies, is that it, the old way didn't actually become obsolete. It's a right. different way of doing something. You, you know, if I use Acorn as project management, it is a different way of managing a project, but it looks very much like a centralized tool I might have, I might have used. You know, that, mm -hmm. and, so, and so that piece of the motivation to change is not there. So what we decided to lean heavily on was um, actually three things. W one is the values of the decentralized web and, and that you have more choice. And, and in a lot of cases, there's still gonna be a, kind. There's, there's probably, you know, Microsoft or Amazon or Google in the background someplace because data is right. getting stored somewhere, you, you know, at some point. So that, that may be true for some of the tools, you know, but, but that you could actually, that you have more control over the tools, the peers and usage, and you're, you're sort of less at risk to a centralized actor being between you and whatever happens next. Um, so leaning against that value, the, the sort of democratization aspect of it um, as being an important value. Um, the, the second thing is that it can do some things some of the other technologies don't do quite as well. And, right. and that, that has to do with sort of things that have to do with it, like chain of custody or provenance. So if you have use cases with which that's particularly important, maybe you want to say, yes, this tomato is organic. Right. And here's right. how we know there can be some D-Web applications that really help you do that. And they change what the model looks like to say this is an organic tomato because you don't have somebody inspecting at every point because you can have smart contracts and D-Web tools helping you along the way, right? Yeah. And, and um, so, so, you know, we're sort of leaning against those use cases that may be a little bit more unique. Um, and, and then also just trying to demystify the technology in non-hype language. Right, right. You, you know, and, and <laughs> just that talking about it, and uh, this is where it's useful, and this is where it may be too much yeah. for project management. I mean, Acorn's a pretty cool tool. I, 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 I love the mental model that it used, but for most organizations, it's it's probably not going to be a game changing thing for them. Can you explain what Acorn is? Just it's to... a project management tool b built on top of a blockchain, and it's uh -huh. it's it's got a one of the things that's got a really nice modality is the the tool itself works by um, 
you, you know, you think about, okay, what, what's the impact I want to have? And then you break that apart into cards that can be assigned, right? And right. it's a nice little tool for, for, you know, us to be synced up. We both have to have opened it at the same time. You know, you, you have to be working with us. So it, it has a couple of limitations, but it's, um, but it's, a, it's a, actually, I think it's a terrific tool. I'm not sure that it's the place I would start organizations with DWeb because they're going to feel like, why is this different from it's what It's the I same, think? right? Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah the way I, they experience it doesn't feel different enough. I feel like there's a funny challenge because the, I think first people, people first, and this is sort of also reflected in kind of the last 20 years of people trying to bring, you know, Linux down from the mountaintop to the people. And I think particularly in nonprofit land, the initial kind of wave is people going, well, you should use this software because it's the right thing. And, you know, you're a you're a righteous organization. And, you know, any nonprofit is aware that there are, you know, you both have to be righteous and kind of get things done. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like you're not, you know, I mean, you're not going to go and like rob banks to like do your thing. But at the same time, like, you know. Um, you, 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 you do, you make compromises all the time. And also most nonprofits like set of values are not particularly encoded in their technology as yeah. opposed to yeah. folks in our space where like their values kind of come out of the technology yeah. they use. Um, so then you get, like you say, this second wave where you go, okay, so like, you're not going to use this software because it's, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, freedom enhancing or, or uh, um, doesn't doesn't give profits to big tech or whatever. Um, so we should make it the same as the existing tech. We should have like peer um, to parity, right? Like LibreOffice was the yeah. office suite that is pretty feature for feature, very comparable to 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 uh, Microsoft or Apple products. And then you run into the problem, like people go, well, why? I'm fine, <laughs> thanks. I mean, it just looks the same, only I don't know it. Um, uh, and that's, that's, I think, the bit where pe most people get stuck, where they're like, well, we sold you on what was novel about it, and we told you on how it's not that different. Um, what else can we do? And when I'm thinking about this, I feel like the the compelling thing is partly the value, right? Partly the threat model, um, but partly sometimes you just go, it's it's better, right? It's just it it does this thing in a way that you wouldn't be able to do. Yeah. Um, and the list of those features is pretty short because you're dealing with billion dollar industries, but in sectors like this where the eyes of the, that sector are not on this, right? And the values are relatively aligned. I think that there is, there is often opportunities. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't want to put you on the spot and say, what are those compelling yeah. features? You, you kind of went over it, but like, what are, I guess the other way, what are like nonprofit, what do you see nonprofits kind of needing that these, these, the, 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 the isn't being provided by tech at the moment? Yeah. I think one of the things we're seeing with as we look at a lot of the use cases and tools, a lot of them are about money transfer. Oh, right? interesting. We, right. all, yeah. we all know nonprofits need financial resources, using Bitcoin as part of being able to manage th those resources and come up with creative ways of funding in communities, supporting unbanked, doing things like that. Those are all those are all interesting use cases. I, my worry about those is that often technologists circle around for nonprofits things that have to do with fundraising and managing volunteers because those cross all nonprofit organizations right. so it's, you have a you have an easy big market and we're not getting to the the more localized subsectors and helping solve their problems and so i'm particularly interested in the use cases that aren't necessarily about fi financial management. I'm, I, I think the idea of using decentralized web for certification, whether it's in the form of non-fungible tokens or smart contracts is pretty e interesting, particularly, I think it's interesting in places where civil society may be closing. Let's say I'm an organization 
in uh, a, a country, a regime change comes in, they outlaw that type of organization. And now, now I, I, I cease to be a nonprofit organization, not because I've changed anything I'm doing, right? Not because I still don't have the aims of civil society, but because there's been a legislative change that means I no longer have governmental valorization of my status. You, you can encode that in smart contracts that help provide that valorization. We could encode a community saying, no, they're still doing the same things they were doing before and we value it. This, this is how I learned to read, it's how my mom learned to read, and it's how my kids are learning to read. You, you know, so you can have community members coming in and providing that valorization that allows us to say, oh, this is still a, a, an organization that's acting in the values that we have agreed are part of the values and aims of civil society, even if the government has, you know, sort of rescinded the token that they get to trade to, to say they get resources. So I think, you know, that's one example, but you can apply that to, to many other things where you're saying, well, it provides an opportunity for community to say this is important to us mm -hmm. and to provide it with a stamp of legitimacy. And so that certification is interesting. I think anything attached to supply chains is pretty interesting because we can start thinking about and looking at ways to say, oh, the, the jeans I'm wearing, how much human trafficking was involved in making those jeans? How much dumping of dye in rivers was involved in making these jeans? Yeah. You, you know, how much exploitation was involved in shipping them and getting them into the store where I bought them? You, you know, whatever it is, you can, you can start capturing more of that in more efficient ways than inspections you know, and more yeah. vulnerable ways. And so I think organizations that are working in those areas, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of opportunity for them to look at some of the non-financial benefits. And it's not because I think the financial benefits aren't valid, but it's because I, I feel like it's, it, th those don't need us to think about and help explain because they're going to have a lot of people putting their big brains and attention on those because it is such a, an obvious use case for so many organizations. Right, right. The, yeah, I think, and again, you have that situation where I think, um, I'm so it, it seems like sometimes what the, the, so when you talk about, you know, if you're an outlawed organization or just like there are being deliberate impediments being put in your path, right? Like the, the, the licensing thing we talked about earlier, where it wasn't that like um, civil society w was being outlawed by law, it was just using the law to outlaw um, effectively d d disable them. And I, I think often of times where there is, uh, um, so one thing I noticed with nonprofits around the world is often the conditions in the country change so that they uh, have to move out, right? Or they have to like relocate their resources or their people. Um, before the internet, that was utterly disruptive, of course, right? Because you've shut down the office, what do you do? Then it's sort of, it, it became, the disruption was deliberately engineered so that, um, like you said, data storage, right? Like you will pass a law saying the data has to be kept here and therefore we have access to it. Or um, you would target the big tech companies and go, you know, this is not a legitimate organization in our, in our environment. So having, having the tools that, and systems be mobile, movable, right? So you could take them and go was, is, was super important. And I don't have any solutions in the in the decentralized. I just emphasize, right? That this is just one of those things where big tech companies are often and 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 uh, things that are designed to interface with like government bureaucracies are often not very good at those edge cases, um, and that is exploited as a weapon by by opponents of these things, right? You want to bury somebody in red tape. Um, and having ways to get around that uh, uh, is 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 important, I think. So, 
jumping way out of this. So you're you're the you're the are you the CEO or the CTO? Because you've obviously got a technical background of TechSoup. Uh, I am the chief community impact officer for TechSoup as a whole and the CEO of Caravan Studios, which is the division where we build products and. Um, I was going to ask you, like, tell me a little bit about Caravan Studios and how that fits in and what you what you in particular do. Absolutely. So what we Caravan Studios is a small um, division of TechSoup where we actually go in and work with community organizations to generate opportunities for technology interventions. and we've played with that word intervention a lot. Like, is it the right <laughs> word for us to use? But, you know, are we really building products? Are we really doing this? But it has a slight you know, Alcoholics Anonymous it kind does, of feel, does, right? Like, that can't be right. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, pull you into a room and, and have a deep heart to heart. But, but ultimately, we've stayed with that word because sometimes what we're doing is organizing volunteers to capture data about, around a community and get it into an existing set of tools so that it becomes usable to them. We did that in southern Brazil around bus route data. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it wasn't a matter of building a product. It was a, a matter of getting the data into a digital format so existing products could consume it and you could see bus routes in a mobile way. And um, in other instances, in other instances, it is just describing the problem and then handing it off to the local community so they can say, okay, what is our community will and our political will to resolve this problem at this cost, right? Because they're, they're balancing it. Any solution is a multi-criteria decision, right? And in other cases, it's building a product. So we um, have a little product that is so dear to my heart that that I love that is quite simple. It is called Range. It so, shows where a school child, a school age child in the United States can get a free meal during the summertime. And it works the way that, you know, I use Yelp or other tools when I'm traveling on business. You open it up and you're the blue dot and the red dots are the places that are open for you to go get a lunch. You, you know, with no sign up, we don't, you don't have to log in to use this. You don't, we're not capturing any data. We're importing data from the federal government, um, you know, on where those school lunches are. So we build things like that because we found out it didn't exist, you know, and, and it's just making that data more useful in a mobile form. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's like perennially interesting to me and touches on what we were just talking about is we're getting that data from the government because we want to make sure it's trustworthy data. Right. That we, we know that, that humans can do wonderful things to support one another and do horrible things to harm one another. And um, we do too much work in human trafficking to be naive about the things people set up to help recruit in that area. And so we take this federal government data because we know it's gone through this process at the local, at the state, and at the federal level to be trusted. We also know it's a subset of what's actually available to those young people during the summer. We, de- de- like decentralized technologies, we're starting to think about, ah, are there ways we can use that as trust mechanisms so that we can get more organizations in there? We don't have to depend on this bureaucratic process to give us trustworthy data. We can use other things that allow us to validate lunch sites and get more data into a tool like that. You know, I, I, I mean, I think that that to me is at the at the heart of this promise. It's not necessary of, of the D-Web tools and the work that we do day in and day out is that so often what we do is we're operationalizing trust one way or another. Right. And so the more mechanisms we have to say, this is trusted information that we can operationalize. This is a trusted resource that we can deliver to you. This is a recipient that, that, that needs this resource. You know, the more ways we can identify those trusted endpoints and the, the more trusted endpoints we can operationalize, you, you know, the more that we get the resources that are, are at, I think, at the heart of civil society flowing through, whether it's trusted journalism from somebody out in the field to like, yeah, that's a safe place for an eight year old to go and get a meal. Yeah. And I think, you know, trust is is a real is a I feel like big tech centralized services in many ways centralize up 
because they need some way of encoding trust, right? And it's it's a, you it, it's almost a way of kicking the can down the line a bit, where we just go, oh, we'll have some people <laughs> like Although sign off on this, right? Really and, I mean, we have it in our yeah. yeah, yeah. And then uh, and as things grow, you realize that's not going to work. Um, and then the decentralized space, you at least the problem is front and center, right? You, the first thing you do is like, well, how do I trust anything in this, yeah. right? Like there isn't a core. So you, you, you really do have to focus on it. And it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that you have all the answers, but it does mean you have to sit there and think more carefully about how does this actually work in the real world? Because, you know, I don't go, I don't go to the government and say, well, who should I speak to on the street, right? Or like, mm -hmm. what do I do in my community? But what I do do is a lot more complicated than something that that, that, that is easily encodable into our technology. Um, I mean, t t just to sort of riff off of that a little bit, I mean, one of the biggest trust challenges when you are discussing and working over the possibilities of a new thing or advising, um, uh, a, a community uh, or a, a, a small institution is why should they trust you, <laughs> right? Like there's the, or you know what 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 are your interests, right? Um, and I think one of the things that really excited us when we were we were talking about um, how 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 you engage with this is is this sort of um, idea of makers and ex uh, I, I think that the thing we settled on was accelerating makers, right? Um, and, uh, maybe, you, maybe you can like, what, what do makers mean for you? What does, why did, why did you sort of come with that, that, that term in, in, in mind? Because, you know, it isn't something that people traditionally think of when they think about a nonprofit. Whenever we started talking about Caravan Studios 10 years ago now, one of the th reasons we started it was to understand what was blocking um, all kinds of people from building tools specifically for nonprofit organizations. At that time, we were talking about the modular web. Why aren't there more WordPress plugins? You know, right, why aren't right. there more Drupal things that help meet the needs of nonprofit organizations? And so we said, okay, well, let's figure it out by making some, right? And going in and doing that. And, and along that journey, one of the things that we discovered is the people that come in with a passion for something to make a digital tool for good comes from all, they come from all kinds of backgrounds. They might be program officers, they might be technologists, they might be people like me that have a strong technological imagination and an ability to raise funds. They might be people that are, you know, have a strong ability to put their fingers on a keyboard and make something, but they, they don't have the marketing and the reach. So we started thinking about, well, what can we do to support those makers? I mentioned before we have a team of anthropologists. So we put them on this question and we interviewed a bunch of makers and it was hard for us to figure out who they were. So we looked for public good technology, things that didn't have a for-profit use necessarily, but were clearly in the box of civil society. Then we looked to see who made it and then we talked to them. Um, and we found out that these folks worked for all kinds of organizations. Sometimes they worked inside a nonprofit organization. Sometimes they were, it was part of an organized volunteer effort. Sometimes it was a technologist that was doing something during their off hours. And sometimes it was a company, you know, that, that, that had this kind of support and tooling as part of their aim. Um, but when we looked at it, we saw some of the same vicious cycles uh, afflicting what was blocking them. You know, there was not enough funding to provide resources for the, for these groups. And so they were doing cost cutting that was ending up hurting them. They didn't have access to mentors and help to like sort of grow their technology and set it up in a way that it could be successful or, the, or I should say that they could deal with success if it came, you know, and without it breaking them. And, um, and, and we also saw that they didn't have a, a community of people around them. So what we wanted to do is say, well, let's provide a structure that, so that we can support people making these tools so that their tools are useful, get used, and are sustainable. So there's a terrific book called Power to the Public that has a rubric for thinking about public good technologies that's about design, data, and delivery. And so we borrowed from that rubric to say, well, how do we help makers who we know come from this wide background 
how do we help them think about data? How do we think, help them think about design? And how do we help them think about delivery? And then on the civil society side, how are we helping those organizations use that same construct to evaluate not just the tool, but the partner that they're engaging with? So, this, that, so that way we can say, OK, on data, you want to have a terms of use. You want to know how it's protected. You want to know who's between you and a, you know, turning the data over. Right Here are the questions you makers should be prepared to answer. And you, civil society organization, you should expect an answer to. Right. You, right. you know, and, th and this is how you can make your decision. So it's interesting because we were able to use that, start thinking about that at rubric as a common ground that could be a place where both could bring their expertise, you know, so that they had a common place to talk to one another. We added to that rubric two other areas just because it came up so frequently in our interview. One was describing impact. A lot of people that make these tools don't know how to describe the impact that they're trying to get in a way that helps them get the attention of civil society leaders, whether they're sitting in foundations making decisions about funding or they're inside an organization making a decision about the tool they're going to use. And it's not just about using things like log frames and theories of change, though that's some of it. A lot of it is because the baseline data isn't there. So they, it makes it very hard to say this is what is going to be different because we're putting this into place, mm -hmm. you know? And a lot of, it, so, so that's, you know, we added that. And then the other thing we added was the idea of community um, so that we're creating inclusive communities that, that people feel like they can belong to. Quite a few of the, the women identified makers that we interviewed asked for not to be recorded. They, did, it, they didn't feel safe in technological environments always or, or that they were well respected in those environments and so you know we it, it made us think about how we all have to be more intentional in the communities that we both build and join um, if they aren't open to a whole subset <laughs> of, of the folks that may wish to join and so yeah I might get technical great technical answers on that particular website but if it's a, a, a place that doesn't doesn't welcome some segment of population for whatever reason, maybe I shouldn't be going there to get my answers. Maybe I, I shouldn't be perpetuating that, that side of my work. And that, that's a tough thing, right? That's a tough balance. And that's, that's where in some way our relationship with corporations is super helpful because we can create and set up mentorships and do things like that. So we can, we can pull outside of, of some of those groups. I this really resonates with me just because this was my experience sort of in the digital security space where we would we would go out to communities on, on, on nonprofits, right? And we're trying to teach them, you know, how to use Signal or, or just basic kind of security hygiene. And you sort of go, well, how, I mean, it's very hard to teach because you sort of have to combine some some novel tech, although you can simplify it, but also like they're the people who understand what the th risks are and right. so forth, right? What that threat model is. And what I came away with, and we sort of ended up riffing off was that there would be one or two people within that community who could apply both of those things because they, you know, they were a person in the community and they were interested in, in, this, in this particular area, right? Um, and empowering those people, but not empowering them too much, because like, you know, you can go mad with power, um, but, but, you know, kind of like walking them through the whole thing um, meant that, that, you know, that, that, that was more equitable, right? And um, uh, it, was, it, was, it was more configured. You were just sort of like, you were supporting the community, but you weren't trying to like turn them all into, you know, DEF CON attendees or whatever. Right, right. Um, the challenge, as you as you as you highlight, right, and I, 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 is, I mean, that is by its very nature a distributed community, right? Like, there's one or two people, two two if you're lucky, but you're probably like the one weirdo in your group, right? Yeah. Um, you know, not that weird, like just being like the person who's really into being a blacksmith in the village, yeah. right? It's, um, and then to best empower them you should connect them and yeah if they're people who are already sort of a little bit like 
you know, they're from a community that doesn't usually connect to that community, whether it's through gender or race or location or how much money they have, yeah. then like you have to do a lot of work to work out, well, okay, here's where all the knowledge of your peers is. Here's where you are. Like, how do we, how do we make this, this bigger? And I mean, I do think that like the, the, one of the reasons why people, our communities are sort of excited, were excited about the internet, are excited now about decentralized tech is because it sort of reflects how they use and build communities themselves, right? Yeah. They are a distributed yeah. community. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. That's, uh, that's, in that's interesting. I think one of the things, I mean, I think we have this really timely and horrible model of the dangers of centralized technology and what was previously called Twitter. You, you know, what happens when one person takes it over and starts changing the rules and it changes the trust and safety paradigm you have when enacting on those. It changes what happens to the data that you gave under one set of agreements in the form of your words or the links that you shared or who you followed 10 years ago. You, you know, um, what, 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 what happens when you have one actor that can have such an influence on what was thought of as a public town square, you, you know, and, and make some communities and some individuals feel so unwelcome inside it. And I think, you, you know, I think it, it, it shows what was hard about um, what it is he case that shows us what can go wrong with centralized technology, however it may manifest. Right. right. But and, also, yeah, don't, don't. I was just going to say, and I think what what Mastodon gives is a counterexample and a way to talk about what it looks like for communities to form with clear ways of self-governance and use protocols to decide we can join up with these communities and let go of it. I think decentralized web takes that federated model one step further by saying we actually have to encode some of the rules in there. And there are places where if you change your mind about those constitutional rules, those rules about how the communication works or flows, it's going to show up too. It's not that you can't change it, it's that you can't erase it. Yeah. And, 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 and I think it's an interesting thing because what we've seen is talking about that change from Twitter to Mastodon helps people understand, oh, that's why I should put up with it being a little hard to figure out how to join a server or why it's harder to follow people. It, it actually makes some of the pain points a little clearer, but we've found it to be a great bridge to actually talking about a wider variety of decentralized that, that, that yeah. is a, a little closer to what people are, are, are seeing and getting right now. It, yeah, and it makes it feel too. less edge and and less sort of extreme that some of the use cases can seem yeah, sometimes to where we're know. going oh yeah if you are being targeted by your authoritarian government yeah going, exactly. well i'm not yet um yeah. <laughs> uh yeah i and also I highlight some of the services and live in missouri but that's a different yeah, story yeah right i the I, but it also highlights some of the challenges where like you know i really listen to people who go actually i found like mastodon like unwelcoming yep um because what was previously kind of a background uh enforcement of the rules right now feels like a sort of social enforcement like go there and like people go no you have to put a content warning on you know u.s political statements and they're going what well, why did i know that and who is this rando telling me telling you know telling me off um, and you sort of go, yeah, that is a problem. Like, and, and it's a social, but it's also a technological problem. The other thing that I think works both ways with, with Mastodon, Mastodon is a recurring topic of discussion, okay. blue sky in these, in these, in these talk, uh, interviews is um, one of the things we would always try and say is like, well, the good thing is you can move your data around, right? Like on Filecoin, you could move it to another storage provider or on IP IPFS. The whole point is, you know, there isn't a vendor or whatever. Um, and lots of people kind of go, 
why would I do that? <laughs> right? Like, you know, I've been, I've used Google all my life and you can't go, well, look, at these are all the people who, you know, had their Google account like cancelled for some arbitrary reason and now completely screwed. And they sort of go, well, I hope that doesn't happen to me. Um, and then when you go to Mastodon, as you say, people go, oh, I sort of get it. Like I can now move, you know, if, if, if the equivalent of Twitter changes, I can move, but that is still quite difficult, speaking of someone who did it myself. And secondly, I'm not sure everybody feels more secure and safe when the answer to everything is like, well, you could just move. <laughs> like, you know, you can pack everything up here and go yeah. over there. Um, and, and, and that's kind of psychological safety, but it's also technologically mediated right if there's a button that i can press that moves me like every 10 seconds and it's fine then it ceases to be a a, a thing of psychological insecurity but yeah i i think that i mean it, it definitely the analogy definitely breaks down when you start getting like like, but how do I do that? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the same thing that comes up with with blockchain things. When you when you say, well, anybody can investigate the blockchain. It's like anybody really can you do it right now? Like, can you open up your and screen share with me and do it right now? If I'm telling that to an executive director of an organization, I say anybody can do it. Can anybody in in their right. organization do it? Right. right. Anybody at all? You know. Yeah. Um, now, is it doable? And, and so I think the difference between it, it, it's doable by anybody and anybody can do it, yeah. it is, is actually a big difference. And I think that's yeah. a huge part of our role, honestly, is one, helping train people to be able to do it, um, to find people they might trust to do it for them when it's important, right. but, but also to be able to say, actually, there's probably a bunch of places you don't need to worry about it that much. Right. Like right. at the end of the day, if we're yeah. talking about seeds for your local community garden, you probably don't need to track whose house they're in with a smart contract. <laughs> That's probably just fine. And it's it's a huge role to be able to play the person, the technical mediator, whether it's it's Caravan Studios, TechSoup, or just this maker in a community who can say, you know, you actually don't have to worry about yeah. this, right? This yeah. is like... You know, someone yeah. will try and sell you on this, yeah. um, you know, well-meaning digital security people yeah. like me in a previous life will be going, if you don't use encryption, you will be in trouble. But like at some point, it's, you, you know, yeah. you, you, all of these people are taking risks, whether yeah. it's the risk of not being paid as much as you could be and like going and starting a, a thing that, you know, is, is, is about helping people. Um, that's a risk, right? You're yeah. taking a risk. Yeah. Um, or in more extreme situations where you're literally putting your life on the line, right? Like you're, you, you've already got a risk assessment. Yeah. Maybe using decentralized technology like adds to that risk. Yeah. Or maybe it's sort of like, I remember having these conversations where I was going and this will make you feel safe or whatever. And people were going, look, I throw Molotov cocktails yeah, <laughs> like yeah, every night, yeah. I, I, you know, in my town. I'm pretty comfortable with a certain level of risk. Um, yeah. And and that's great, right? Yeah, I, I mean, we certainly heard that from people. They're like, you want me to have two-factor authentication, but if I have somebody pointing a gun at me, like that, they're not breaking into my account by like hacking. They're breaking into their account by threatening me or my family with violence if I don't let them in. Two-factor right. authentication does not help with the risk I have. Right, right. right. You know, because that's not how my risk manifests. Yeah. You, you know, I am physically in peril, not digitally in peril. Right. <laughs> and so, so we certainly heard that kind of thing. I, I mean, to my mind, this is the place, I, I mean, it's why we you know, are using this rubric to describe how to talk about it because it does become a meeting ground that allows somebody making technology to say like, okay, I want to meet these standards around data so that I can describe it. And it helps an organization make a decision about whether that's going to meet their needs or not. And it goes from how many nonprofits can feel, which is like, I have some technologists telling me to just trust them. And I don't even understand how the thing works. You yeah. know, I can't just try, I don't, I don't have anything to hang my trust on. 
Yeah. You know, I don't yeah. have any scaffolding for having a conversation with them or knowing what to ask or what I should care about so that I can make the decision if I can just trust them or not. Yeah. So just providing a simple scaffolding so that you're saying, this is the way we're going to bucket the conversations that you have with each other. Yeah. So, and, and then you get to decide nonprofit if how they design something is really important to you or not. If it's not, awesome. Don't worry about the questions in that bucket. Yeah. You know, if this other part is important to you, then do worry about the questions in that in that bucket, right? And it and that common language we've found is is really important. And I mean, it's one of the things we do a lot at Caravan is think about how can we provide tools that equalize technologists and non-technologists in the room while still valuing the expertise that each is bringing into the conversation. Like one of the the things we do at the beginning. Um, which everybody super, super hates, and I would too if I were being forced to do this, is we have people draw each other. They pair up, like you and I would pair up, and we would draw each other on our name tags. I would write your name and draw you, and that's your name tag, and you would write my name and draw me, and that's my name tag. It makes everybody in the room equally uncomfortable, They they and then they laugh, and they talk, and they walk around, but it sets this thing like it's okay if we're not perfect at the thing we're about to do. Right, right. That's really good. I really like that. The, I also think a lot about like the wider aims of like, again, a lot of reasons, often people get into the decentralized web and, and web three and all of these things actually because they have, um, uh, ideology is wrong right but like in the same way as drives people it's to non right it's a value a val system. exactly yeah. a value system and like some of it is represented in what they build but some of it is broader than that and like one of the things that people really are trying to build with these systems is to give people autonomy right yeah um and some of the thing the reasons why they like technology is because it's given them autonomy yeah. Um, because they understand it and it lets them do things, yeah. right? And um, uh, sometimes that's the disconnect, right? Which is like, this could really help you, but like, it's not. I don't know what's going wrong. But also some of it is like, I want, in the best situations, it's like, I want you to be able to have this sort of liberatory um, relationship with technology that I have, right? It's like teaching someone to drive a car, right? Where you're going, I can't explain it yet, but like, if you have this skill, you will be able to like go and do all of these things. Um, and, uh, and I do, th the best projects that we see at FFDW have a little bit of this, a little yeah. bit of the kind of, um, you ca should be able to mold this technology locally to your to your needs and in some ways that kind of, that's kind of independent like you've you've talked about the modular nature of like you know some microsoft products and the best kind of enterprise stuff can be bent into a non-profit shape um but i really think it kind of matches the value system yeah where the best people are like going i'm making this thing but i'm not making it so that i have control over you you know, accidentally or not, I'm trying to make it so that it's it, it's for you and you have complete control over it. Yeah, um, it, it, it's interesting. The, the, that, that's a really interesting perspective that I one of the things that we looked at in in the research to sort of understand what we might do with D-Web and makers is look at results from the open source community. Right. Like we said, here's an equally complex technology that's values driven, that goes through this cycle. You know, what can we learn about people that adopted this technology at ways that maybe were beyond cost savings, right? Okay, I'm using LibreOffice because I can use it legally and I'm not, I'm not paying for it, you know, and it's feature rich enough for me. Um, you know, what, whatever it might be. And we didn't actually get good findings from there because where we saw it, it was mostly people that had a, a really high level of control over the technology and could access it. But what's interesting in what you were just saying, I think that's, that I want to go back and look at is this idea of agency, 
because mm -hmm. that's different, right? That I feel yeah. like I have agency over the technology, yeah. agency over where my data is stored, agency over what my use looks like, agency over, you know, what colors it is or how, how well it conforms to my particular use case. And the degree of agency that's required to really embed technology into a nonprofit organization's workflow so that it starts to feel like it's a part of that workflow. That's a, that's a really interesting way to think about how a nonprofit might feel this without having to know actually how it works, which is incredibly hard. And we're yeah. all really used to living in a complex world where we make decisions. Right. About I don't, I don't know, know how anything works. <laughs> I don't know how this actually works, but I know what to do if mine stops working. Right, so, right, right. And, and the steps. Yeah. So I feel like I have agency over it. I don't feel like I'm at the mercy of it. Right. And I think the, you know, the people think of this temporar temporarily where they go, oh, there was a time when people really liked the internet and it was fun. And now it's kind of, yeah. you know, people have a much more stressful relationship to it. Um, but I actually also think that that has something to do with that. Like when you feel like you're kind of in control, uh, or that it doesn't matter, right? Like, you know, being on a roller coaster is a kind of control, right? Like you're going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm safe, right? But like, I've decided to do this thing, even if I've committed to a scary ride. To the situation that, you know, I feel like in the modern internet where I'm like going, I don't really know what is mine and what is, you know, like, well, why I'm is this going to go away? <laughs> is this like, who, yeah. why am I being shown these things? Yeah. Right. And, and it, for me, at least like, that's what it, that's the bit where when I see people who feel safe and I see people who feel anxious, I'm always like, is it because do you feel like you're in control because you feel safe? Or do you feel safe because you're in control? And, yeah. yeah, it's a mix. Yeah, there's something consumer reports ish we need about, I think, some of these algorithms and underlying technology. You know, like, mm -hmm. like you don't know, I don't know how to tell a car is safe or not safe on the lot, but I, I, right. I, I trust a group that maybe has gone through and rated it. And, and that rating and their the quality of their rating is transparent. I think there's an opportunity for us to start applying some of that to things like large language models and some of the underlying technology. I think, I certainly think decentralized technologies can provide more agency and an opportunity for us to instantiate the rules. It's almost impossible for that to not also be more work yeah. for the individual user, you know? And so, understanding how to articulate the trade-offs so people know where and when to make them. You know, I, the, um, I, I, I think that is, and, and the realities in particular environments. I mean, there are parts of the world where Facebook is the internet. And to say I'm not going to participate on Facebook is to not be on the internet, to not sell your goods, right. to not communicate with your family. It's not realistic. It's not a realistic stance to take. Yeah. And so you'd have to be pretty privileged to take that stance, actually, or, you know, and um, out of choice. And so I, I think that those are the kinds of things where, like, figuring out how we describe that balance and where we help put in some decentralized technologies to support those systems. I just think, and, and it's why I think, I mean, going back to the beginning of our conversation, I think starting with some use cases where it's hard for nonprofits to do some things like validating goods along a supply chain, um, saying, I really did take this picture at this place at this time. Um, you, you know, like the, those are, whether it's of litter on a beach or whether it's of a war crime. Right. You, you right. know, the, those are use cases where the D web is doing things differently and easier and better and cheaper than other technologies. So it's easy to see why you might suffer the switching costs yeah associated with that and maybe that those to, to, i think those in many cases are the right starting place and then and then other like heavy values thing i'm a huge fan of this little project called policy kit that plugs into things so that you're replacing administrative rules with a set of rules so it's not about like i know who to ask to make a slack channel it's about, I know the rules that make a Slack channel. Right. And, right. And, and, and I think that 
making the rules for governance transparent is actually how we create, I, th- I think, a better sense of belonging and yeah. a more equal footing because it keeps it from being unwritten and assumed. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think that, that we made a sort of understandable error when a lot of things got described as trustless. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, people kind of go, well, I that's the one thing I want, right? I don't want like no trust. And you're going, well, actually what it's about is you can work in an environment where the trust isn't kind of imposed externally, right? And it doesn't have to be complete. I can trust you with my name, but not my social security number. Right, right, exactly, (laughs) right? I don't have to completely trust you about everything, which is kind of what I have to do with Google or Amazon, right? I'm basically going... Yeah, you seem trustworthy. I'm a little uncomfortable with the fact that I have to like trust you with everything in my life, right? Because the failure mode is so terrible. Um, and we're in this environment where everything is, is as granular as it is um, uh, in real life. Yeah. And, uh, and connecting real life and connecting technology seems to be something that, that your team is very good at doing. Um, this is my wrap up kind of, uh, <laughs> um, and so thank you very much for working with us on trying to explore this world. And, um, if folks want to find out more about, um, uh, what Caravan Studios is doing, where's the best place? What's the best search term to caravanstudios.org. To... Great. Great. Is a, is a great place to start. Excellent. And, uh, and, uh, I, I hope to speak to you again soon. Um, and, um, and be able to retell the stories of the, the, yeah. the things that you find. Thanks we so will much. share as we learn. Thank you very much. Thank you.